I've had lots of requests for this one, so thank you for all of your patience, but I've finally got around to watching episode one of Euphoria. Let's crack on. 13, 14, 15, 16. What are you looking at, Rue? 17. Rue, look at me. One, two, three. What are you doing, Rue? <laughs> Just counting, right? I'd say she's suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder. It's not like I was physically abused. Attention deficit disorder. Or had a shortage of clean water. General anxiety disorder. Or was molested by a family member. And possibly bipolar disorder. But she's a little young to tell. Or she's a very normal child learning to count. You cannot diagnose a toddler with OCD or bipolar. And what on earth makes her think that somebody like this has got ADHD when actually they show a remarkable ability to focus on details in the ceiling and to be able to count and pay attention like that and it's actually the upsetting bit is when that gets interrupted rather than inability to focus. <laughs> Blimey. It's just the way your brain was hardwired. Plenty of great, intelligent, funny, interesting and creative people have struggled with the same things you struggle with. Like who? Uh... Vincent Van Gogh, <laughs> Sylvia Plath, and your favorite, Britney Spears. Oh my God. There have been some really famous examples of people that are creative and have a mental illness where their creativity has been at least in part attributed to their mental illness. So Vincent van Gogh was one of them, Tchaikovsky, Tesla and OCD. There's some people that thought Mozart had Tourette's, he didn't. Presuming those medicines are all psychotropic medications, i.e. ones to treat mental illnesses, I am already incredibly skeptical about why any child would need to be on that many tablets. It suggests either misdiagnosis and or a lack of psychological treatments to complement smaller numbers of medicines that might be used for legitimate mental disorders. Is she having a panic attack? I die. They're really common and they're terrifying. Most people have probably experienced or seen somebody or know somebody that's experienced a panic attack. It can come on quite out of the blue. Sometimes there's predictable triggers like in the context of phobias. Sometimes though, with actual panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder, the triggers can be really unpredictable and that's what makes it even more frightening. You never know when the next one is gonna come. The breathing into a paper bag thing is actually something that can help people. Panic attacks can cause people to spiral. The fear triggers your fight and flight response. The fight and flight response is all about getting extra oxygen to your tissues to either fight or to flight. So that means your breathing increases to get more oxygen in and your heart rate goes up to transport that oxygen around. The difference here though is you don't need that extra oxygen. You don't actually need to fight and flight because even though your brain is scared, there's actually nothing to be really scared of. So when you breathe quickly, you don't need that extra oxygen. What ends up happening as a side effect is you breathe off too much carbon dioxide. That causes tingling in your fingers, that makes you dizzy and that causes it to spiral even more. So one way to try and reduce the chance of that happening is to rebreathe the air that you've just breathed out to try and keep hold of more carbon dioxide and to try and use that to reduce the spiral that happens with a panic attack. <coughs> What's she gonna take? What's she got in there? Xanax. Yeah, Xanax is creeping over here as well. It's not something that we prescribe, but it's something that is being accessed through the dark web and things like that. Xanax is the brand name for a drug called Alprazolam. This is a benzodiazepine that is prescribed, I believe, in places like the States for anxiety. We don't tend to use it here because benzodiazepines cause dependency. People get hooked on them. They lose their effects, then you need more and more of it to have the same effect, and you can get withdrawal symptoms if you miss it. Some people can even then get the cravings that we associate with addiction. For most people, anxiety is a chronic disorder. So if you're going to be on a medicine for it, you need to be on one that is ideally not going to lose its effectiveness over time and end up causing you more problems by adding a dependency syndrome alongside the other list of diagnoses that you've got. When everything stops, your heart, your lungs, and finally your brain. And everything you feel and wish and want to forget, it all just sinks. And then suddenly... It only helps you avoid for so long. You give it air again. Give it life again.
I remember the first time it happened to me, I got so scared I wanted to call 911, go to the hospital and be kept alive by machines and apple juice. She touched on this element of agency and control. I gave it life again. Remember, anxiety disorders are illnesses, but the negative cognitions that come in with anxiety and depressive disorders mean there's a big tendency to blame yourself and punish yourself really for not having better control over the way that you think and you feel. And it's really not as easy as that. And in those times where it's really terrifying and overwhelming, what do we want? We want someone else to look after us for a bit. I spent a good portion of the summer before junior year in rehab. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. She's so young. Drug and alcohol rehabilitation is all about trying to understand your relationship with the drug or the alcohol that you're consuming. Think about what is it that triggers you and makes you use it and what is it that you're actually seeking from it. It helps people confront this, what we call cognitive dissonance, where you go, I know it's bad for me, yet I keep doing it. Because those two things almost contradict each other and it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. And the behavior of actually reaching for the drug or the alcohol is quite difficult to change. So most people then change their thought patterns to try and justify that use and rationalize it and normalize it. Rehab is designed to try and address the thoughts and the behaviors head on and work through it by facing it rather than avoiding it. That's if it's done properly. That's if it's done well. India so propyl 5 methoxytryptamine. It's a fast acting psychedelic. Got some similarities to LSD but with like key differences. Not as visual as shit but definitely a sense disorder. The tryptamine bit is referring to serotonin, 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine. But we commonly see that the more serotonergic the drug, the more psychedelic the experience. Jules moved from the city to the suburbs after her mom and dad got divorced. She doesn't really like to talk about it, but dads almost never get full custody, so you know, some shit definitely went down. I hope they don't go down some sort of voyeuristic route at exploring somebody's trauma. Early life trauma can be a risk factor for mental illness, but it's very rare that this just in and of itself as a sole entity explains everything to do with a mental illness. That's what makes them so complicated. They are multifactorial. There are multiple risk factors. Now, there's a few ways to beat a drug test. The first is simple, stop doing drugs. But yes. if you're in a bind and totally fucked, option one, niacin. It's a B vitamin that like Don't do this, breaks down fat ever. and chemicals or whatever. And if you take a lot of it, like 2,000 milligrams, and chug a few gallons of water, you can flush your system in Yeah, but you're days. toxic if you take the it in overdose. Is it has a few side effects. Skin flushing, extreme dizziness, vomiting, rapid heartbeat, and sometimes death. I don't recommend it. Please don't do it. The drinking loads of water with the idea that you can flush your kidneys through it's a myth. It doesn't work. Your kidneys are incredibly specialised. They're the most complex organ in your body, I would say. Oh, apart from the brain, obviously. The kidney very, very finely tunes how much it filters through, what it keeps hold of, what it gets rid of. Trust your kidneys. And if you drink way too much water, there's a risk of side effects like diluting your sodium levels down in your blood called hyponatremia that can cause problems in and of itself. Option two, synthetic urine. Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah, fucking right. Option three. Get a non-drug addict friend to piss for you. Oh, what a good friend. The only problem is most over-the-counter home drug testing kits come with a heat sensor strip that detects the temperature of your urine. Ah. And if your parents watch you pee, you can't really do the sink trick. Well, I'm getting an education here because I didn't know about the sink trick. I didn't know that synthetic urine was a thing either. Well, you lost your right to privacy after your overdose. That was a mistake. Don't be flip room. I presume that's what then led to her going to rehab. And if it's an overdose, I'm gonna go out on a limb and suggest it's an opioid. Lots of countries are struggling with opioid crises. We have a high amount of opioid abuse in the UK. I know that the States is probably ahead of everywhere else in the world when it comes to that. It's one of the most common drugs that people can overdose on. If you've not used it for even just a few days, you can lose what's called your tolerance, your body's ability to kind of get used to and put up with a certain amount where you end up needing more and more for the same effect. So if you lose that and you go back to what you were using when you did have tolerance, 
you're more likely to overdose. There are also increasing numbers of reports where heroin is being laced with a much more potent opioid called fentanyl. Often people aren't aware that that's what's in it. And then if you take the same amount that you were taking before, you're more likely to overdose. And this is why there are quite rightfully some big public health campaigns that are still not getting as much traction as they should do about having more access to an opioid blocker called naloxone that can be administered to somebody that has overdose that can stop somebody dying of an overdose. It's a life-saving intervention. Real? Real. Oh, is this her sister walking in on the overdose? Oh. That's be really traumatic for a kid to walk into. I'm serious, Rue. I've seen a lot of people die. None like you. Nah, I don't know what type of fucked up shit you got going inside your head. And I don't know how to help. But I could tell you one thing, this drug shit is not the answer. Sometimes you need a friend to do a bit of straight talking and acknowledge the unknowns that somebody's clearly psychologically struggling. But I think it's a common thing for people that are behaving in a way that maybe they can see as destructive and dangerous to them to feel helpless and want to help and support somebody psychologically, but without wanting to condone the behavior that's manifesting from whatever distress they're experiencing. You know, I remember when I was 11 years old. It was a couple months after my dad got diagnosed and we got the results back from the prognosis. And it was really good. It was like 80-20. And we decided to celebrate. So we ordered a bunch of Chinese food. <laughs> I remember that night I was laying between my parents in bed. And, uh... All of a sudden, I couldn't breathe. It was like there was no more air left in the world. And I was gasping and I was panicking. His first panic attack must have been and terrifying. They the ambulance and they thought it was like an allergic reaction or some shit. And then when I got to the hospital, they gave me liquid volume. <laughs> yeah calm me down. In acute settings where somebody is incredibly distressed and there's no other way of alleviating it, some people might go and give people benzodiazepines to try and settle things and sedate things down. But long term, it doesn't work. It just makes things worse. So when somebody has recurrent panic attacks, particularly when the triggers are not always predictable and clear cut, then actually we need to be managing this with a combination of other medications and psychological work. So the SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, can be really, really effective. They're never gonna take this away on their own, but if you combine that with types of cognitive behavioral therapy, then actually the outcomes from panic attacks can be really good. The anxiety that bubbles underneath is much more difficult to treat, but panic attacks can respond really, really well to the right treatment. This is the feeling I've been searching for my entire life for as long as I can remember, because suddenly... A temporary relief. The world went quiet. And I felt safe in my own head. Two years later, he was gone. Panic attacks stayed. And I found a way to live, so... So we've got a young woman whose early childhood development was very, very medicalized. Stupid diagnosis of bipolar when you're a toddler. There's the element of grief that was preceded by panic disorders where the grief has then probably made those worse. And these are happening at a time where somebody's personality is being shaped. It's a recipe for huge amounts of distress and there's lots of things to unpick. And part of unpicking this is acknowledging that substance use is a symptom of the underlying distress. It's not really a treatment and a way of relieving it. It may feel like that at the time, but actually it's perpetuating the problem. This feels like almost a deeper, probably slightly more realistic version of 13 Reasons Why. There are some graphic scenes that come in this episode that I've specifically chosen not to show you. I've done that consciously because I want to make sure there's no element of voyeurism, but also I don't want anybody to feel triggered by stuff that might come up. These episodes are meant to be a help to try and understand various aspects of psychiatry, mental illness, rather than an, a sort of a way of sort of 
gawking at the more gory aspects. Let me know what you thought in the comments below and particularly if there's any other episodes in season one that you want me to look at, let me know and you can kind of direct me on the best ones to go to. Otherwise, don't forget to like, subscribe and I'll see you soon.